Okay then, folks. Well, here we are then, um, as I say, once more at a CCD at a conference. And this time the, the focus is on impact, disability impact, which I kind of half named in fun, really. As, uh, in the UK, we, have, we are constantly told that our work has to have impact, um, which is kind of quite, quite interesting to be told that. Um, but um, also, you know, we've been talking in disability studies about impact and the impact of disability um, for decades, you know, that we didn't, didn't actually need that reminder. Um, and I think one, of the, one or two of the few uh, things to uh, perhaps just underscore then, you know, disability impact, um, you know, disability impacts um, uh, in, in various ways and sometimes that impact is ignored and that's one of the perhaps hardest things to deal with. Um, you know, I've talked about avoidance in the past, uh, we've had a conference based on avoidance in the past um, and uh, everyone in disability studies knows what that means when certain uh, aspects of our work are constantly left off lists, left out of, um, uh, out of um, uh, various sort of um, venues and so on. Um, so there's that aspect of, of impact where it's ignored. There's the aspect of impact where disability is and can be you know, devastating uh, to the human being and to the society and the whole thing is, can be really difficult. Um, and we have to sort of admit that and lots of us know that firsthand. Um, but then the other part which is too frequently missed is that disability impacts on lots of things in positive ways. So we might think about disability pride. I don't need to tell anyone here about that. Lots of people have done much more work than I have on, on this. Um, but we might think about disability in terms of identity, of in, in terms of uh, community. And I think we've got an example of that in this room right now. Um, and then the other aspect, of course, which perhaps you know where I'm going with this, is the impact on knowledge. And again, this is one of those areas that uh, are so frequently questioned, you know, how can, they are talking about having their own theories now, whatever next sort of thing, you know. Uh, and goodness knows that um, critical theory has always been uh, a dirty word in, in the academy, but add disability in there and you have to kind of prove your existence on, on, on a daily basis. Somebody asked me once, am I still an activist? At first I said, was I ever? And then I said, yeah, well, I think I suppose I am on a daily basis, just going into work and saying you do disability studies you know, the eyes roll, the, the sort of fists come out, and, <laughs> and then the day begins, you know? So we're, in disability studies, we're all activists, whether we like it or not. Just doing your job is an activist uh, expression, as it were. Um, so anyway, in that direction, I'm going to now move into um, introducing, introducing the first plenary. And, and it's my hope that this will give you a really good idea of the work that we do here at Liverpool uh, University, and especially in, in the CCDS. Um, one, some of you will be aware that I started a book series uh, a few years ago, very, quite recently this, this one is, uh, and it's called Autocritical uh, Disability Studies. Um, it started from, from a, a book that, that I put into that series, um, but then I'm so pleased that um, my colleagues uh, here in the CCDS entered into the spirit of this and proposed books for the series. Um, and it's really around that that this first uh, plenary is going to circle, as it were. Um, so um, many of us today will be thinking about um, JLCDS and this book series. And I should say that we've got a few things uh, up at the back there. We do have um, copies of JLCDS that you can just take away. We've got uh, all sorts of back issues that Owen's put out there. Um, and um, you, you just take those as you wish. And we also have some books there that if you fancy reviewing them, um, you know, just pick one up and, and make a note that you're going to, to review that Ella, Ella Houston has, has set that up. Uh, and I mentioned uh, Ella and Owen as they are, are the two key people uh, on, on the board in terms of um, um, the comments uh, editor and um, the boot reviews editor. Um, but in this room we have many um, JLCDS board members. So uh, welcome to you all. Uh, uh, the, the journal is, um, you know, moving from strength to strength, but only on, on account of your work uh, in that. Um, so putting this, the journal aside uh, for a second, um, I'm going to move more into this, uh, this book series idea then. Um, so one of um, the people who, who, who you'll be uh, hearing speak in a moment uh, is uh, Dr. Owen Barden, who is an Associate Professor in Disability Studies here. And, and I think most of you would know him from, from his 
work at the conference here uh, that we've done before, but also is uh, widely published. Um, and I'm pleased to say he's going to have a book in the series, um, I would suggest in a couple of years' time, thereabouts. He's already uh, contracted, though that's the key thing. Um, another person on, on, this, uh, on this same panel is Ella Houston, Dr. Ella Houston. She's a senior lecturer uh, in disability studies. Um, and I would make mention an aside that 10 years ago we were, start, we were launching the Disability Studies MA here and Ella was actually a student, the first student on that course. And she's now a senior lecturer here and she's got a book in the series and, and various uh, other very important roles in, in, in disability studies in the CCDS and, and indeed in the teaching team. Um, so it's, it's nice to have her uh, uh, with us still, as it were. Um, and then I'm going to now move over to the first speaker, um, and this is um, um, Dr. Erin Pritchard, who is also a senior lecturer in disability studies. Um, she was in the first um, edited book in, in, the, in this book series, um, and she had a chapter in that book, and she already has a monograph out in the series. Um, so this year's monograph um, so far is 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 Erin's. Um, so I think the best thing I can do is is just get out of the way and let Erin make a start. Um, so thank you. Sorry. Um, okay. Uh, so yeah. So as uh, Professor Bolt says, I'm going to be talking about maybe monograph. Uh, which is called Midgetism, the Exploitation and Discrimination of People with Dwarfism. Now, first and foremost, I want to say I hate the word midget, okay? It's an extremely offensive term, one that I've been working to try and get abolished in various places. So people go, well, why are you using it now? I'm using it in an academic sense, and I'm using it to explore various discriminatory attitudes and practices that lead to the unequal standing of people with dwarfism in society attitudes that everybody is used to, that's so normal in society, but really impact how people with dwarfism are treated. And so I want to make that distinction first. I'm a person with dwarfism. That is a condition. Midget, it's never been a condition. It's always been used as a cultural term to denounce people with dwarfism, the oppression they experience, so it's popularised in that freak show. And that's where it still resides in modern day freaks. Okay, so I'm gonna, I will try and explain that bit. So, as they've said, it's part of the Autocritical Discourse series, um, Disability Studies series, sorry. Um, in it, I engage with the tripartite model of disability, which is again from David Bolt. Um, and this is to give a nuanced uh, sort of analysis of representations and attitudes. And I also introduced several new terms or concepts that are. Um, including the term midgetism, which explains any sort of discrimination people with dwarfism experience. Midget entertainers, so that's a repurposing of the term midget, because I want to make a distinction between people with dwarfism and people with dwarfism who choose to humiliate themselves, basically, and create discrimination for the rest of us. But also this concept of the non-normate space, which can be applied to places like freak shows or even associations for people with dwarfism might get on to that if I've got time, but it's just because it's from like a geographical perspective. Okay, so I'm reclaiming this term midget um, for advocacy purposes, basically, and activism, and academic purposes. So it's a combination, I suppose, of heightism and disabledism. So a lot of the time when there's unique prejudices that people with dwarfism experience, for example, being hired out for birthday parties, being hired out for baby showers, where dwarfism is seen as more of a novelty than a disability. It's a funny creature, basically. Okay, it's dehumanised, it's something you can play with. And so, in the image behind me, there is called Little Yet Large Dwarf Hire. So this is where you go to hire out dwarfs. This is one of the many places you can go to hire out dwarfs, and I'm not advertising it. But as you can see, there are several midget entertainers dressed up as Uncle Lumpers, and they're doing what I've just sort of referred to as like the midget pose. They've got jazz hands, they're smiling broadly because they're just funny and they want you to be entertained by them. Okay, so this is where we purpose in this term midget entertainer. They partake in stuff that would be off limits to anyone else. Okay, try hiring out a wheelchair user. Try hiring out any other minority group in that same way. Okay, I've actually 
seen this because um, they on, on websites they say it's not degrading. Our midget entertainers love it. So I uh, and they said you know give them a job. So I actually used my personal email address, but they didn't know who I was. I said, well you know if it's so great and it gives them a job, do you do it with any other disabled people? And I'm still waiting for their response. Okay, not that I want to hire anyone out um, or give them any ideas even. So I'm repurposing those, and so it's not to be applied to a person, it's to be applied to a practice, okay, anything that creates this. Now, like I said, it's a combination with heightism, and because what we experience is not heightism, because I usually, when I'm trying to expose this discrimination, like getting rid of the word midget or something, I usually get people who are short, maybe a foot taller than me, so I think they're tall actually, trying to act as the authoritative voice on dwarfism. Well, I'm five foot, so I know what it's like to be a dwarf. And it's like, well, how much did you pay for your pedal extensions? And they soon shut up. Okay, how many times has somebody stopped to take photos of you? No? Okay. And so that's, it's that, so it's like the authority here is people with dwarfism, this is midgetism. People who are, have a dis disability or who are just short cannot speak about these experiences. Okay, so I want to show how midgetism is got its roots really in the freak show. Okay, you know, there were problematic representations uh, before this, but really this is where dwarfism was sort of put on show, um, you know, as well as any other, like quite a few other disabled people, certain types of disabilities, as well as ethnic minorities, to be exploited because they had non-normative bodies. And I argue that this freak is always culturally produced, as Bogdan says, so it's not... You don't have a self-made freak and a born freak. All freaks are self-made. Okay, just because you've been born with a certain condition doesn't mean you're a freak until you decide to exploit that. Okay, so even though freak shows started to die down at the turn of the 20th century, major entertainment flourished. Okay, because we still see it. It's, it's fine. They enjoy it. Okay, so one of the ones that I look at in this book is the Kingdom of Little People in China. It's a theme park. But it doesn't have roller coasters or anything like that. It's populated by midget entertainers. And of course, it's run by an average sized man who profits from that, just like P.T. Barnum did in the 18th, 19th century. And uh, so basically, in that image, you can see them, it's like a fantasy land. It's like these, this fantasy land, these um, like little houses with turrets and all that look like something out of mythology. And it's just populated by dwarves that'll dance for you, or midget entertainers, sorry. And basically, this reflects like sort of Norse mythology, where dwarfs are depicted as a separate race, living in a fantasy land away from the normal people. And you can still see this evident in films such as like Willy Wonka, uh, Wizard of Oz, uh, and of course Snow White, and um, place and Willow, of course, where we are seen as we're not part of society. So this is kingdom of little people, and you can go to it, and you can pick up dwarfs, and you can take photos of dwarfs. And again, they say it's because they face discrimination. Well, lots of other disabled people face discrimination, but you don't put them in a fantasy land, and nor should you. Okay? Um, so I explore some of these consequences of midget entertainment, including the impact, you know, the, the main impact it has on people with dwarfism. One of the things is people stop to take photos of you. Okay? So it's not enough just to stare at a dwarf. Now with smartphones, People stop cars, people, you know, they take photos and they put them on social media groups like Facebook, in groups such as I Hate Midgets or Aren't Midgets Funny, and apparently this does not go against Facebook's community standards, but there again, we know how low their standards are, okay, and so those are the kind of things that happen, they go, yeah, look, I spotted a midget, isn't it funny? Oh, you need to get out more. <laughs> Perfect. So then I look at this modern day freak show, Midget Wrestling. So in 2018, now midget wrestling is mainly in the US, but in 2018 they decided to come over to the UK. And again, I was told by people that don't have dwarfism that it's not offensive, it's fun. I was like, okay. And so what it is, like, I do know, probably know if you're familiar with wrestling, it's a form of sports entertainment. So that's how it differs from regular sports like running, rugby, football. It's fake. I'm sorry to break that to anyone here, okay? <laughs> Um, people don't really get hit with steel chairs. But what you do have there, you have these big, beyond average sized men, big muscular men, so it's a lot of machoism in it. But then along come these midget entertainers, these midget wrestlers. 
And of course that creates this incongruous encounter because they don't belong there. But also this superiority because even the audiences know that the midget wrestlers won't stand a chance against them. Now, in, uh, in wrestling, there's a lot of um, performances, you know, a lot of backroom performances, you know, against wrestlers. And the midget wrestlers always do stuff that would always be off limits to the other wrestlers. Like, for example, running into the ring and biting the backside of the referee. Okay, I've never seen Hulk Hogan do that. Okay, so the other thing is, between two wrestlers, there is one, they always have a mini version of the other wrestler, like a pet. Okay, it's always like your pet, that's what a midget entertainer is, it's someone's pet, someone's unruly dog. Because in one scene, it pans out from this wrestler, and one of the mini wrestlers, or midget wrestlers, is dry humping his leg. Again, that's not something I've seen the Ultimate Warrior or the Undertaker do, but it's okay because a midget is not human, he's more like your pet chihuahua, okay, that you just knock off, spray the water, get rid of it. And so as Mark Seeley, aka Little Legs, because they always have this term, you know, they've always got to be called little, small, whatever. Um, he says, I don't do that. I just do the comedy stuff. I don't need to pick up a six foot bloke. No, Mark, you cannot pick up a six foot bloke, okay? Let's not think that you're that tough or strong. You cannot pick up a six foot bloke. So here we're exposing that they're incapable of doing that. Now that's not to say that Somebody with dwarfism can't do weightlifting or anything, there's plenty that do, but let's be realistic, you cannot pick up this man. So that's why they have to do a lot of this comedy stuff. And people go there to laugh at them, okay? And so we try to get that stopped, but of course, they were saying, oh, but it's a job for them. If we stop it, one of them's gonna lose their house. No, you're gonna lose out financially, okay? The average size promoter is gonna lose out financially. And as one of the promoters says, I'm more interesting when I'm surrounded by 14 midgets. Well, you're a very boring bloke, I'm sorry <laughs> to tell you. Okay. And then, this is one of the excuses that really grinds me. It's a job for them. All oh, right, so we're incapable of doing anything else. We can't be doctors, we can't be lawyers, we can't be teachers, okay? I can't be an academic, okay? We've got to be this humiliating form of entertainment. And so I talk, I open it up by talking about job discrimination, employment discrimination. And it's funny, when I've been discriminated from jobs, and when other people with dwarfism have been discriminated from jobs, nobody gets your corner, nobody finds your corner to say, ah, oh, but it's a job for them. When it comes down to things like dwarf tossing and all midget tossing, it's like, but it's a job for them. No. Let's not pretend we're all about disability equality here. What you're saying is, I like to laugh at them. I like to feel superior to them. That's why it's a job. Okay, and one lawyer tried to defend it and said, well, it's all about their height. They're using their height to their advantage, like basketball players do. Well, no, because basketball players are showing skill. A midget is being used as the, the target, as the ball, as the dart. Okay, again, being used as a commodity to be dehumanised. Big difference. So in that image there, I'm showing this, um, a midget being tossed. He's wearing a helmet, a Superman t-shirt, and behind him is a bunch of tossers, basically. That's <laughs> the only way to describe them. But then we come to this thing, it's just a joke. All oh, right, it's just a joke. Well, if you look at the superiority theory of humour, it's not just a joke because it has social consequences. Now the image there is of uh, a pantomime, and it's seven dwarves, and front and centre, as he always is, is Warren Davis, patron, yeah, you know I love him, <laughs> patron of LP UK, which says that they promote a positive representation of dwarfism. He's in a costume there, in a bright colourful costume, again doing the dwarf pose with his jazz hands and a big smile, you know, we are there to be laughed at. It's so positive that people can't help but ask other dwarves, where's your six little friends? Are you happy? Are you grumpy? All the time because it's just a joke. But this is constant in society. Okay, so it's this superiority that we are always degraded to make people feel better. And this is where the heightism comes out, because being bigger is better. You walk tall, you know, and you're not small-minded. So, um, I then look at some of these excuses, and one of the things I look at 
is the case of Quaden Vale. So you might remember it from a few years ago. Little boy, a little Australian boy with dwarfism. His mother filmed him crying because he wanted to kill himself. He was only about seven or something at the time, and he wanted to kill himself. And I'm sorry to say, that is not a unique experience amongst people with dwarfism. I know we always go around as happy little beings, but actually, there are high cases of suicide amongst people with dwarfism. Because anybody who has to be abused day in, day out is going to find this. So, one of the things that is um, with Quaid and Bales is Hugh Jackman was like, oh, poor Quaidon, you know, you're great, you're great. Hugh Jackman played P.T. Barnum in The Great Showman, where we were all encouraged that, look, the freaks love being stared at. Okay, you're not helping, Hugh. Okay? Thank you, I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, so the last one, you, okay, these two minutes, is fighting militarism. How do we fight it? Well, we need allies. Well, in these associations with people with dwarfism, Unfortunately, they're mostly dominated by average-sized parents who, again, tell us what it's like to be a dwarf. And who tell us, well, and these pages are just, you know, full of parents with dwarfs, and, uh, full of average-sized parents going, my child, my child's lactose intolerant, what's that got to do with dwarfism? Please tell me. And it's like, nothing, okay? And, oh, well, you know, I don't want to hear about this, you know, these campaigns or anything because it upsets me. Well, you know what, the experiences upset me. So we're always shouted down and told, you know, we're undervalued and undermined. That's what a lot of people do often say at these places, because the ableism comes into them. Because the dominant voice, and as they would say, is that they tell us what it's like. They challenge our own experiences and beliefs. So I do individual activism, because I don't see the point in trying to, you know, get people that have got such internalised ableism. Um, but that's the only way forward, and so a lot of these groups now have become pe for people with dwarfism only, because that's the only way we can have that voice. Okay, thank you. very much as well to Professor David Bolt for inviting us to deliver this plenary. Um, much appreciated. Please could you go to the next slide? As argued by David Hebe, charity advertising is in quotes predicated on the social non-worth of disabled people, creating a division between the so-called big-hearted i.e. they're the benevolent, non-disabled people, and the, in quotes, disabled beggars. Despite disabled people pissing on pity for decades, they have been represented as sad cases in charity advertisements, which have influenced how vast numbers of people perceive disability. Throughout history, charity promotions and advertising has pervaded public life, with forlorn money box statues of disabled children, and guide dogs scattered around shops and towns, huge billboards lamenting the lives of people with impairments. And in more recent years, fundraising appeals now feature so often in magazines and television advertising breaks that we consider them to be tedious, mm. albeit those that are particularly hard hitting or heartstring tugging um, often go viral on social media, gaining millions of likes and spreading pity-provoking messages across the globe. <coughs> drawing, on a, drawing on a chapter from my upcoming book, Advertising Disability, which will feature in Professor Bolt's Autocritical Disability Studies book series, my presentation focuses on the extent to which portrayals of disability have changed in charity advertising in recent years. As a core member of the CCDS, and senior lecturer in disability studies at Liverpool Hope University, who researches representations of disability in advertising. 
I am particularly interested in the persuasive and often very subtle ways in which advertisements communicate messages about disability. Although disability charities seem to be veering away from dehumanising, overtly offensive advertising campaigns, um, for example, increasingly charity advertisements are focusing on inspiring campaigns that show disabled people fighting back against societal stigma, alongside advertisements that urge people to challenge disabling barriers and attitudes. The main message that continues to be sent out is that disabled people are inherently, in quotes, different from the rest of society, reinforcing what Professor David Bolt describes as the normative social order. In past decades, pity-provoking charity advertisements promoted harmful attitudes towards disability in explicit ways. For instance, the black and white print advertisement featured on this slide was produced by the UK's, um, forgive me for using this slur, Spastic Society, which is now known as Scope, in the 1960s. So the tagline, which includes the slur again, is in quotes, John is a spastic, he needs your help. And this is positioned beneath the close-up image of a young boy, while smaller text says that John desperately needs the care and the training that we can give him, and thousands of children like him. Will you join us in getting John on his feet? Making a desperate cry for help, stating that a disabled child needs to be saved by non-disabled benefactors, while using a motive, pity-provoking black and white imagery, this fundraising appeal exemplifies historical disability charity advertisements. With disabled activist complaints about charities being dismissed as militant for many years, as Susan Scott Parker documents, signs of change have only emerged recently. Various high-profile disability charities have rebranded, for example, there's MenCap's shift towards raising awareness of barriers that impact people with learning disabilities, in contrast to its previously infamous Little Stephen logo, which was a cartoon depiction of a despondent-looking um, young disabled boy. The notion that sad cells is now much less popular in charity advertising. With donate and dash appeals being replaced by campaigns that encourage audience to invest in charities' missions and values. Um, seeing the positive differences their donations can make. However, despite its increasingly positive veneer, Charity advertising continues to promote paternalistic attitudes towards disabled people, implying that their happiness and ability to make the most out of life depends on kind-hearted, non-disabled benefactors. <laughs> While disability charity advertisements often leave non-disabled audiences with warm, fuzzy feelings, they other disabled people, treating them as though their main desire in life is receiving <coughs> mercy from other people. Okay, so given the financial repercussions associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, the cost of living crisis, and growing scrutiny towards how charities manage their affairs, with members of the public frequently dismissing high-profile charities as businesses rather than good causes, donations to charities have hit an unprecedented low in the UK. In particular, audiences are increasingly cynical towards charity advertisements, criticising them as marketing ploys, and feeling more inspired when advertisements show them the positive results of their generosity. Contemporary appeals typically associate donating to charities with uplifting sentiments, such as feeling proud that you are someone who cares about people and is inspired to help people who are worse off than you, while also enjoying a sense of reassurance that your altruistic acts will buy you good karma. This emphasis on positive mindsets 
Persuading audiences that an optimistic, go-getting approach to life is the key to bringing about change is part of a wider popular trend that is now constantly promoted and commodified in advertising and wider society of being the change that you want to see in the world. <laughs> While I don't have sufficient time now to expand on this point, critiquing how neoliberal ideology seeks to persuade individuals that they are responsible for righting the wrongs of society and in ways that typically boil down to consumerist acts working on the self and just being more productive, this argument is explored in depth in my book, Advertising <coughs> Disability. However, what I will say now is that superficially positive charity campaigns exist against a backdrop, but against a backdrop of, in quotes, humble brags hashtag that are ubiquitous across social media, with people often sharing stories and images of themselves, helping the so-called needy gaining likes and many more followers in the process, alongside a volume and variety of profit-driven companies capitalising from the charity glow that appeals to a generation of consumers expecting, as Carlson says, brands to give back. <coughs> Rather than being forces for good, for instance by challenging the demeaning and disabling stereotypes that charities have played a huge role in constructing over the decades, Contemporary charity advertising um, overwhelmingly targets non-disabled audiences' egoistic needs for feeling good. A sense of self-satisfaction and pride for helping those who are supposedly less fortunate. Using false notion of assumed authority as non-disabled people's arrogant, patronising and self-serving <laughs> attitudes are frequently, in quotes, cloaked in helpfulness. I suggest that even though they appear to be turning over a new leaf, many, ch many charity advertisements continue to encourage non-disabled audiences to feel a sense of superiority towards disabled people. Perversely, research by Leon Atkinson finds that people who donate to charities prefer advertisements to portray, in quotes, happy victims, who, despite <coughs> tragic circumstances, can now look forward to much brighter futures thanks to charitable interventions. Rather than being exposed to images of doom and gloom, like what we saw in Scope's um, advertisement in the previous slide, many people now um, struggle to relate these images to their own lives and experiences, and instead prefer to see the positive results of their generosity. The problematic aspects of the positive appeal approach is exemplified in a television advertisement produced by UK charity Guide Dogs for the Blind. The advertisement, which features Emma, who is visually impaired, her guide dog, Jazz, and her two young children, demonstrates how charity advertisements contribute to the normative social order by depicting disability, in this case blindness, as, in Rosemary Garland Thompson's words, a sentimental, in quotes, project that morally enables a non-disabled rescuer. The awe oh effect is invoked from the beginning of the advertisement with scenes of Jazz, the guide dog, as a puppy, and Emma's story emphasising the benefits that are associated with donating, as the advertisement focuses on her walking outside, grocery shopping, and visiting a playground with Jazz and her children. On this slide, I've included a screenshot from the advertisement showing Emma patting Jazz lovingly. The advertisement is accompanied by soft, uplifting piano music that builds a sense of intimacy and optimism whilst Emma, while Emma's child narrates the part of the advertisement and says, See Jazz and Mum walk us to school. That wasn't very easy for Mum before. Her eyes don't work properly. See Jazz help Mum be Mum. Followed by Emma. Every hour, someone in the UK, someone goes blind. For just £1 a week, you can sponsor a puppy like Jazz and help a life like mine. However, in previous research where I've interviewed women who are visually impaired about advertisements that represent blindness, this advertisement in particular has drawn a lot of criticism. In the words of one participant, in quotes, it's made out that before Emma had her dog, she couldn't do anything at all, she couldn't function. I found it so infuriating to support a life like mine, like blindness is some sort of disease. I know it's funding for guide dogs, great, but it's like begging. 
people are going to see that advertisement and think it's not just Emma, that all blind people can't do it either. I know that losing sight is difficult, so as I mentioned, this participant had visual impairments themselves, um, and there will be people in Emma's position, but she's being made to be a victim of her circumstances. Because of ads like this, people perceive that all blind people should have guide dogs, unless you have one and you're just a bit crap and you're not functioning. In some ways, it actually puts me off wanting to get a guide dog. I feel like I'm losing a bit of my own identity because of it. That definitely comes across in that ad. It's almost like the dog is top dog, leader of the pack, and you're just there. As right height, thank you, David. <laughs> um, as right highlights, the cruel irony is that fundraising campaigns provide those who donate with an opportunity to humanise themselves by using a group of people that wider society dehumanises on a regular basis. Despite the feel-good vibes that contemporary charity advertisements seek to elicit, they capitalise from the assumption that disabled people can't do anything without interference from others. Moreover, these campaigns reinforce the toxic idea that disabled people's lives could be so different if only they accepted help from other people. Using Gray's concept of benevolent othering, I suggest that although recent charity advertisements seem to endorse the bright side of things, the underlying assumption is that the changes disabled people are waiting for can simply be brought about by charities and non-disabled people. Drawing on Gray's words, benevolent othering occurs when actions and messages appear to be positive and caring on the surface, in quotes, despite functioning to maintain the subordination of people who are oppressed. One of the problems with the proliferation of charity advertisements featuring disabled people is that they reinforce the implicit message that without charity, disabled people's livelihood and achievements would not be possible. Thank you. Try that again. Morning, everyone. Morning. That's more like it. All right. So thank you very much. So, um, yeah, my title is uh, Learning with Learning Disability. And the with uh, is important, uh, hence the italics. So it's not from and it's not about, uh, but it's with. And as we go along, um, I'll try to articulate what that means. <coughs> uh, and the subtitle is What Learning Disability Can Teach Us About Being Human. And throughout the book... Uh, of which this paper is a precursor, I'll be making the argument that um, learning disability is what Ian Hacking, uh, RIP, called uh, an organising concept. That's a concept which helps us make sense uh, of what it means to be human, what it means to be a person, or indeed not to be a person. And so in this sense, we all live with and learn about ourselves and others through the very existence of a thing called learning disability. <clears throat> now, when I first proposed this book, uh, this quote is one of the first things that arrived in my mind. It's from Dan Goodley, who's sitting in the room and looking right at me. <laughs> it says, maybe there's nothing more ableist in character than a sole academic banging on about the world <clears throat> and as I say this this quote is uh, one of the first things that came to mind as I uh, proposed this book and started to sit down to write it and so I'm going to give you an outline uh, of the first chapter of the book which I think is going to be the, the hardest to write if there's nothing about us without us how do I avoid becoming that ableist academic how do I avoid becoming one of the tarmac professors that Mike Oliver railed against, rolling over disabled people solely in order to advance my own career? How do I write about my own relationship with disability and learning disability without being self-indulgent, self-justifying, patronising, boring, Moreover, 
how do I write about learning disability at length without reifying it as a thing which undoubtedly exists? when what we really know for sure is that it is merely a historically contingent, shape-shifting, unstable cultural construct. I'm not sure that I can, but I do want to address these troublesome questions by responding to calls from disability studies for scholars to state their relationship with disability, or in other words, the impact that it has had on them. <clears throat> So Simi Linton, for instance, in 2010, wrote this. I think that it is incumbent on non-disabled scholars to pay particular attention to issues of their own identity, their own privilege as non-disabled people, and the relationship of these factors to their scholarship. <coughs> uh, and Joan Corbett O'Toole, and I have to thank David Feeney, who's in the room, for pointing me to this paper, wrote something similar, uh, criticising the fact that in disability studies, we don't talk about our relationships with disability. She said, in disability studies, we need to talk about our relationships with disability, because those relationships lead to valuable differences in experiences of disability and of ableism, and hence opportunities for reciprocal learning, for alliances, and for further theorising not disclosing, shut down such opportunities. And so I'm going to talk about my relationship with disability because it is from that position that I'm going to try and make the case for learning with rather than from learning disability. <clears throat> I am a non-disabled disability studies scholar. <coughs> For better or worse, I'm a white, middle-class, middle-aged British. <laughs> non-disabled disability studies scholar. <coughs> but I do have relationships with disability and impairment. <coughs> One of my children is autistic. One of my parents has been living with cancer for many years. <clears throat> One of my parents has experienced mental health issues in various ways for much of their life, including a spell in an institution in their early 20s. <clears throat> One of my partner's parents experiences dementia, which is progressing rapidly. My sister gets around on a combination of crutches and an electric wheelchair. And I work in a university department with colleagues both disabled and not. <clears throat> not many people work, uh, not many people teach or research disability studies in the grand scheme of things, and so work in a department like mine. But I don't think my set of experiences and relationships are that unusual. Uh, and that brings me to the quote on the screen here, same, same, but different. Uh, my sister lives in Cambodia, uh, and I went to visit her at Easter, and this is a phrase you hear all over Thailand and Cambodia and Southeast Asia. Same, same, but different. It means similar, but not quite the same. Uh, and I'm kind of underscoring this, uh, the fact that, you know, I have my set of relationships with disability and impairment, uh, and they're unique to me, but they're also, you know, uh, similar to lots of other people's. And the image is a cartoon that I have on my desk that my mum gave me many years ago. <coughs> um, and it's of... Uh, a bunch of penguins, a cartoon, a drawing of a bunch of penguins, uh, and they're all balancing a tennis ball on their beak or their head. Uh, if you look carefully, they're all balancing them in slightly different ways. Uh, and the quote underneath is, remember you're unique, just like everybody else. <laughs> right? So it's that same idea that, that we have our similarities, but also uh, we are all unique in our own ways. And Joan Corbett O'Toole was right. Until I wrote this and said it just now, my colleagues didn't know anything about my relationship to disability. They didn't ask, and I didn't tell. <coughs> Were they worried about making me uncomfortable? I can't say. <coughs> Did I have imposter syndrome? Definitely. <laughs> But through stating my relationships to disability, I am hoping that as a non-disabled disability studies scholar, 
I can make a positive contribution to di disability discourse and theory and be an ally for disabled people. <clears throat> I came to care about learning disability in particular serendipitously. I don't have any lived experience of learning disability and as I've said, I embody many of the personal characteristics that generate privilege. What contact do I have with people with labels of learning disability? I mentioned that I have an autistic child. Although autism is commonly defined as a learning disability, my child does not see themselves as learning disabled. Academically, they do very well, currently planning to study biomedical engineering at university with a view to specialise in prosthetics, another way in which disability threads itself through our lives. My child finds some social and emotional things tricky, but has a good circle of close friends, <coughs> has a weekend job that involves a lot of interaction with the public, and is beginning to go to festivals and big concerts, driving themselves and their friends. So it's difficult to characterise my child as having a learning disability, despite what the diagnostic manuals, codes of practice and charities say. <coughs> the realisation that I came to care about learning disability came from elsewhere. It has its origins in study support work that I did in the early 2000s at Liverpool Community College as a friend's suggestion, as a way of funding myself through a master's degree in popular music, rather than any predisposition towards caring for learning disability or learning disabled people. My friend, who incidentally has a 30-year-old diagnosis of bipolar disorder, another way in which disability threads itself through our lives, <coughs> suggested I apply because they thought I had a suitable disposition. <coughs> I worked with many disabled students for many years, uh, mainly with students with labels of specific learning difficulties, dyslexia, dyscalculia, dyspraxia, and so on. And to cut a long story short, that experience led to a teaching qualification, or a set of them, and ultimately a doctorate in education. And for my thesis, I facilitated a participatory project around dyslexic sixth form students' use of Facebook for literacy and learning which ultimately helped persuade their college to change its social media policy. So social media is not all bad, right? <coughs> um, and this project was largely motivated by my discomfort around the pervasive deficit discourse around dyslexia, as well as persistent moral panics around technology and teenagers. That ultimately led me to this job at Liverpool Hope and to the CCDS, where I began first to result to research the history of learning disability, initially uh, through archival methods and then through participatory methods. And that brings me to the central project of this book. <coughs> learning with learning disability through research. And there's a definition of research on the screen here. Uh, research is like finding pieces of a jigsaw. It's looking over and over again. Because sometimes you look at something once, but you don't see the full picture. But when you come back and look at it again, you'll see something different. And the more times you go backward and forward to it, the more you see. So that's good. So the definition comes from an article written by Tina Cook and Pam Inglis, two highly regarded researchers of learning disability, but these are not their words. The quote comes from a participant in one of their research projects. In fact, from a man with a learning disability who was in a secure unit in a hospital. I like it and I include it here because it encapsulates the nature of research concisely and as well as any definition in a methodological textbook. Firstly, it's iterative nature, the need to move back and forth across the object under investigation or construction until you see something different. Secondly, the need to stand back from the object in order to see the full picture. We might conceive of this picture, the full picture, as representing some kind of truth about the object of interest and its place in the world. And of course, another way of re to define research is as a search for truth. 
This search for truth is not to be confused with a search for objectivity. As Tim Ingold has argued, and I have to thank Professor Penketh for giving me his book, uh, what we regard as truth reflects our participation in the world. And as Nick Peem has argued, our knowledge and our quest for more of it cannot be detached from all the background knowledge, understanding, ways of seeing and sense of purpose that we bring consciously or subconsciously to bear on our investigation. <clears throat> yep. I've just talked about two authors who are not disability studies scholars. Tim Ingold is an anthropologist. Nick Peem is a philosopher of education. I've included them because I think it's important that we look outside disability studies if we are to keep it vital and increase its reach. One of the things I find interesting about Nick Peem's work is his contention that scholars should objectify their subjectivity, i.e. acknowledge the ways in which our subjective experiences shape the way we apprehend and interpret the things we research. This is an echo of the call from disability studies to state our relationships with disability. <clears throat> Both Peem and Ingold write compellingly about the way we research things that we care about or have an attachment to. This care is a kind of commitment to the things we investigate, things we are caught up in in our everyday lives. Both write engaging with what Ingold calls real problems and Peem calls useful trouble. Issues that have no conclusive solutions but afford opportunities to see things anew. Learning disability is a real problem. It is useful trouble because it, help us, it can help us understand our relationships with each other, personhood and the world. And Tim Ingold writes beautifully about education as a means of attending to the world, bringing us into correspondence with the world. Etymologically, education means to lead out, well, attend means to stretch towards, from the Latin ad, toward, tendere, stretch. And to correspond means to co-respond, to answer to one another and go along together. And so my intention in this book is to attend to and correspond with learning disability, to stretch reflexively towards it and to keep it present in our considerations of what it means to be human so that we can all, learning disabled and not, go along better together. This is what it means to learn with, not about or from learning disability. Withness, Ingold says, saves the other from objectification by bringing it alongside as a companion or accomplice. It turns othering into togethering. Thank you. Okay, thank you, folks, and thanks uh, especially to Owen, Erin, and Ella. I must say, one of the uh, less nice things about my job is when I have to interrupt colleagues when they're talking about such uh, great and interesting things um, but um, maybe as I've had to do that you'll be aware of this in the sessions that, that continue so help your chairs out by keeping to time as much as you can and if you are a chair then just be as rude as I had to be with my colleagues there <laughs> um, but, um, but just one thing I mean I must say I don't mean this in a patronising way, so please, I hope it doesn't come across, but I can't help but feel incredibly proud when I hear three colleagues speak like that who I, who I work with on a daily basis. Um, certainly, I feel uh, very privileged to, to work alongside them when I hear their work, um, how it's progressing and so on, because uh, we don't always get a chance to hear it in this way, especially work that's um, uh, in the pipeline. Um, you know, obviously, we've, we're getting that very early on. Um, so thank, thanks again to all all of my colleagues there.